Hello and welcome to this video on applications of resonance. In this video, I'm going to talk about um, uh, two different physical systems where resonance plays a role. And then I'll do a little bit of analysis of a simple model um, uh, and show how, uh, for example, how uh, a radio can be uh, interpreted as a simple uh, LC circuit and uh, the tuning phenomenon of, you know, tuning to a station uh, kind of corresponds to um, a resonance phenomenon. Okay, so um, so the the circuit model for a radio, at least a very simple one, is an LRC circuit where we have an inductor in series with a resistor and a capacitor, and these are hooked up to an antenna which provides. Uh, here, I'm, well, so this is really uh, an alternating uh, source, but really what I mean by this is an antenna that may have a complicated combination of frequencies coming in. And so the inductor has an inductance L, the resistor has a resistance R, and a capacitor, a capacitance C. And so for, so for this example, the equation would be L Y double prime plus R Y prime plus C, oh, no, that's a one over C, one over C Y equal, and then the, um, the, the, the antenna or the source of, um, of, of a varying potential uh, on the, from the antenna would be on the other side as an F of T. And you can think of F of T as being, uh, let's say a combination of trig functions, a combination of cosine or sine frequencies. And that's what I'm going to analyze uh, in a little bit. So the idea with a radio is that a radio has um, a tuning knob that controls the capacitor in the following way. You have a plate that's fixed and another plate, I'm going to sit it behind here, that's attached to the knob. And the second plate can be rotated by the knob and you can see that as I rotate this one, either this way or that way, back and forth, more or less of the two plates will come into proximity to each other, and so that would increase or decrease the capacitance. So that's how you get a variable capacitance. And what that does is that will change the natural frequency of the system. So unlike uh, the previous description of resonance I gave in the last video, in this system we have the natural frequency of the system by design is being modified and the incoming signal is what's fixed. Okay, so another system uh, that, you know, where resonance plays a role is in uh, building design. And so uh, with, you know, building design with a skyscraper is most common, um, but actually really, I, I think any any uh, any building where uh, it's been sort of um, earthquake de designed for earthquake proofness. Um, so in a skyscraper, as an example, and I'll, I'll actually attach or I'll, uh, I'll I'll link to a video in the description. Uh, it's a really interesting presentation of some of the challenges involved in uh, large skyscraper design. Um, you can have either wind or earthquakes that will be um, blowing past or shaking the ground. And so you have a bunch of frequencies. In the case of the earthquakes, it'll be you know dictated by the um, the movement of the tectonic plates. In the case of wind, um, the biggest problem seems to be getting what they call um, vortices and asymmetric vortices that cause a variable force uh, on the building. And so when you have that happening, the building can um, you know, it'll undergo uh, some swaying movement, is, and especially if it's designed to do that. And the design question is how um, how much can you influence it by modifying, for example, the mass of the building, a damping coefficient, which would have to be uh, you know designed right into the uh, into the steel structure, and then um, it'll the the structure will also have some kind of a, a spring coefficient, uh, you know, an effective spring coefficient, so that you get this overall spring-like oscillation back and forth um, in response to the forcing. And so here the forcing would be, again, an F of T. And you can think of that F of T as being composed of a bunch of cosines added up together. Okay, so um, 
So what I'm going to do is just talk about a simple case instead of these um, three term ODEs. Let's just think of a single, a single, um, sorry, a simple scenario where you have y double prime plus omega naught squared, where that omega naught characterizes the natural frequency of the system, and there's no damping in the system. Now, if there is damping, um, that will modify the details of the calculation and make it a lot more complicated to carry out, um, but it still it has the same principle uh, at its core. Okay, so here what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the forcing function explicitly be a sum of a finite number of cosine terms where I won't specify necessarily the an, but we're just going to assume that those are fixed. That's given by whatever is happening. So for example, the incoming uh, electromagnetic radiation, you know, the, the incoming wave is going to have a specified set of frequencies to it or the earthquake uh, that's, you know, vibrating the base of the uh, of the tower. So I'll write those out as a n cosine omega n t and <clears throat> what that corresponds to is we have uh, let's say there's three terms in this expression then we would have an a1 that has a low frequency mode. So this would have an amplitude a1 and a frequency omega1 and then we might have um, maybe a higher frequency um, second mode but with lower amplitude and that would be an a2 omega2 and then maybe a uh, intermediate frequency high, uh, sorry intermediate amplitude and high frequency on top of that so when you add those up it, you won't necessarily see any of those periodic signals clearly because they sort of superimpose in complicated ways and the goal with a radio you don't know where you're to tune it and so you need to be able to change your omega knot so that you pick out the signal that you want so each of one of these uh, different frequencies here could correspond to a different radio station and you want to just listen to one radio station not all three at once and that's what the lc circuit should help you do okay and similar thing for the um for the for the building design but in the building design case we don't want to tune our building so that it maximizes the amplitude of the response we want to minimize the amplitude of the response so in either case let's just look and see what this y double prime uh, plus omega naught squared equal uh, y equal sum of cosine terms uh, let's see if we can analyze and just get a picture which could allow us to solve both of these problems uh, you know, in just by then we choose to minimize or maximize based on that diagram. So what we're what our target is then is we want to we know that there's some frequencies hiding in our signal, and we want to choose our omega naught, which is going to be variable, so that the amplitude is either as large as we can make it or as small as we can make it. So we need to fill in this plot here, and the way we're going to do that is we're just going to use a method of undetermined coefficients. So we're going to assume that yp of t is equal to the sum from n equal 1 to n of capital A n, the undetermined coefficients, multiplied by cosine omega n of t. And we could add in a bn sine omega n t. That wouldn't be an, an unreasonable thing to do because that's, the, that's within the family of the cosine functions. But you'll notice because there's no y prime term in the original equation that we're solving, there, the sine terms will never creep in if we don't put them in ourselves. And so if we did include it, we would eventually find that the bn terms were all zero. So let's just make our lives easy and start off with just an ansatz that involves cosines. Okay, so now when we plug this into the equation here, our differential equation, y double prime, that's going to give us... Oh, well, before I do that... Um, there, now, as always with method of undetermined, co undetermined coefficients, when we have a sum of terms on the right-hand side, the we can always include all of the terms all together at the same time, um, but that can often lead to a mess of terms and not fit on your page. So because these are linear systems, we can always break up the right-hand side into pieces and then find the solution for each piece separately and then combine them at the end. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna use a general, um, a general notation 
for one term at a time, but it'll cover all of them at once. And so I'm going to solve the equation y double prime plus omega squared y equal a n cosine omega n. And then I'll be able to get my answer, my capital A, for each little a case, and then add up those answers in the end. And so when I plug in a yp that does not have this sum term, it's just going to be this piece, I get uh, minus omega n squared from the two derivatives, capital A n times the cosine of omega nt plus omega naught squared times a n cosine omega nt. And that is got to be equal to little a n cosine omega nt. And so you can see now our a n is known, although I haven't told you what it is, it's fixed and that's the incoming signal. The capital a n is the response of the system. So that's going to be the amplitude of each mode. And I can get that by canceling out the cosines from all three terms, and then factoring out an an and dividing by what's left, which gives me little a n divided by omega naught squared minus omega n squared. And so you can see here that the amplitude of, of the response to each mode separately will be dependent on how close the frequency of that mode is to the natural frequency of the system. So when we reassemble our solution, we get yp of t is equal to the sum from n equal 1 to capital N of a n over omega naught squared minus omega n squared all multiplied by cosine of omega n t. And that will be our solution. So when we go back up here to this diagram, what we're going to have is we're going to have three separate responses. There's going to be one response based on omega 1. So that one would look like a typical resonance picture. But now we've sort of flipped the axes and we have omega naught varying and omega 1 fixed. But the, but, but the picture is exactly the same. We have a spike in the amplitude of the response at omega 1. And then the further we are away from it, the more it dies off. And then um, we have omega 2 also generating a similar amplitude type of picture. So the response, if I just had the omega 2 frequency in my signal, would look like that amplitude. And then let's do the last one in red. So at omega 3, we would have a third amplitude. And then we have to add all three of these together. So these are infinite at that point and at this point. And at this point. And when we add them together, what we're going to get is we'll get um, something that goes above all of them and has spikes at each of those three locations. So that is the blue is what the sum will look like. So let me just erase it for a second so you can see what it looks like. And so you can see that as you're tuning your radio, if you have an omega naught that's too low, you don't get much of a response at all. As you tune your radio up to omega 1, all of a sudden you get a huge response. And if you want to listen to the station that's broadcasting at omega 1, that's where you should tune your radio. If you keep on changing your capacitance by turning that knob, you'll get another spike in the amplitude. And if you want to listen to a radio station at omega 2, that's where you tune it. And same for omega 3. And so that is how to tune a radio by varying the capacitance, at least for an LC circuit model of a radio. Now for the question of uh, buildings, the amplitude of the oscillation, we want to minimize that. So if we knew that the earthquake was going to have a combination of omega 1, omega 2, and omega 3 frequencies, then we, uh, we want to choose uh, a, a setup so that our m, gamma, and k from this equation over here are ideally placed so that we have, let's say, a minimum amplitude response so that you don't have a risk of the building collapsing. 
and that is uh, a simple case or a simple model for these two uh, applications of resonance.